Well, luckily, and nobody knows this story until just now, but, because I never told anybody because they wouldn't have believed it anyway. Copus tried me again, and that time, I, no one was there and I got him. I wrote him, and when I got done, I was like, huh, that was good. And then I was like, no, what was so different that time? And what was different was that time I thought about staying on instead of coming off. <laughs> and that was the only damn thing that was different. Yeah. So when I finally realized that it didn't really matter if I was a very good cutting horse trainer or not, I was just going to be one and I was going to keep working on it, then I started getting better. Yeah. And it still takes a while even when you start saying that I can instead of that I can't, but right. it's, 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 a, it's a lot quicker once you start doing that. The Converse Cowboy Journey has given me an opportunity to sit down with some amazing performers that are living the Western lifestyle. Or it is my job to tease out their habits and routines so that you can apply and test yourself in your own life. I've learned, I've grown personally, I've been enlightened, and I've been humbled. Above all, I realize that there is no destination in this life, no goal achieved or money made that can replace the feeling of flow and the pursuit of doing what you love to do. With a growth mindset, I'm constantly asking questions and pursuing knowledge. The Converse Cowboy is a platform that allows me to do just that. I'm excited and eager to share their stories with you all. I'm Mike Roberts, and this is The Converse Cowboy. Brought to you by Kerry Kelly Bits and Spurs and Schaefer Outfitter. All right, guys, I'm very grateful uh, to be sitting down with Mr. Tatum Rice today. If uh, if you are in the performance horse world at all, you know the Rice name. And if, you're not, if you don't, you've been living under a rock. <laughs> um, so Tatum Rice, NCHA Hall of Famer, um, lifetime earnings of $3 million, futurity champion in 2018 on Crazy. 2018, Tatum was a world champion on hashtags and reserve horse of the year on hashtags that same year. Um, so Tatum, again, thank you for stopping by, my friend. The way this show set up, we're going to talk about your successes, your failures, uh, mindset, and of course, we're going to talk about horses. And depending on how strong my ADD kicks in, we're going to bounce around a little bit. So, um, I want to go back. I want to start out with a quote. I think you told me on the phone a few weeks ago, and uh, it really sank in with me. You said, "You got to remember who taught you how to saddle a horse." And you were you were referring to your dad, Boyd, and. Uh, just curious to know, what is one thing that stands out? What's one thing that stands out in your head? And I know, I know your dad's taught you a lot, um, but what's one thing specifically that you can still hear him saying that contributes to your success today? Oh, one specific thing I would, I would have to think really hard to answer that adequately. But, uh, you know, that he would be who taught me to saddle a horse, but that's that's just metaphorical you know for who who got you started who taught you the most basic things the most important things that that you probably take for granted now and saddling a horse i've been taking that for granted for about 32 and a half years i think you know mm -hmm. so it's like that's very important and it wasn't dad wasn't the only one that taught me that you know my my mom my grandparents all the people around you know the the very um, the point is you got to remember who taught you the very important things and to remember that those very basic things that you kind of forgot about a long time like learning to write your name or tie your shoes are really where it all starts right right um so in back in 2009 you turn in your non-pro card and uh i'm curious to know from everybody that i sit down with who is competing at an elite level such as yourself um when did you realize that you were good enough to train and show horses professionally? Like, when did that click and say, man, this is what I want to do. This is, this is, I have a passion for this thing and this is what I want to do the rest of my life. Uh, this morning at Silverado, I beat Matt Gaines. That might've been when. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that might've been when. <laughs> Fair enough. No, I, I mean, the truth would be that I wanted to Probably about the day after I learned to saddle a horse was when I knew I wanted to train horses. Okay. But in our in our culture, we talk about how it's a hard way to make a living a lot of times, and and it is. And and we kind of 
we tell people how hard it is. You don't want to lie to somebody, so that's good because it's the truth. But the, the fact is I was always going to train horses. So was Matt Gaines and, you know, whoever. Wesley and Bo, Tag, whoever. Always going to train. And it to me, it's... It would do our it would do our culture a lot of good if we started telling people that you can train horses and you can make a good living because mm -hmm. you actually can, and it's it's not easy, and we shouldn't tell somebody that it is. Nothing worth doing is easy. Right. Um, if it was easy, you wouldn't want to keep on doing it. But but we need to tell people that you can and. It's not that unattainable. Anything, anything that you really, really love and, and pour your heart into is, is attainable. Yep. And so I, you know, I never, I never, the answer is, I don't know exactly how you worded the question, but I never felt comfortable turning in my card. I just finally did it because, well, I'll tell you, somebody said to me, do you think you can compete with R.L. Chartier and Matt Miller? And I said, I don't know, probably not. I said, but I'm not going to be happy until I find out. Yeah. And that was, you know, I remember you just brought up Matt. I'm not going to, he might have said it on his podcast, but he told me a long, long time ago, a well-respected trainer that said to him, do you really, when he turned in his car, do you really think you can compete with us? Yeah, he told us. <laughs> okay. And uh, I remember he told me that and uh, that, that worked itself out. <laughs> that worked itself out. But yeah. it, it really just does, you know. I've had the opportunity to be around a lot of really great people. That was a really, you know, very fortunate to be around those people. And the people in my family really know what they're doing training horses. And that's a blessing. But a, I've been around other, you know, like Kylie's mom and dad, Kevin and Sydney. Kevin's Kevin has a, a successful business, and so a people think assume that the trucking is a good business, and that's that's not necessarily the case. And it's like the Milners, they, uh, you know, they started Taco Bell. So you think that the tacos are a good business, but the fact is, there is really no such thing as a good business or a bad one. Or it's if you. If you're honest and you work hard and you work on the things that you need to work on and you love what you're doing, you can do really well with whatever as long as you just go hard at it and, and love it and really enjoy it. And it's like, you know, that's, that's, that's what we, and I just now really thought of this, but that's what, that's what we need to tell people about, about training horses is that, you know, just as long as you really love it, you can make it work. And, mm -hmm. and, and and really be honest with yourself you know everybody always told me to work hard and pretty much have but i thought what that meant was work horses all the time work horses at night work them early in the morning work them in the afternoon work them when other people aren't working and it does mean that mm -hmm. but it also means you got to be honest with yourself like what do i need to work on and I was always looking at what do I need to work on to learn to train horses better and to show horses better, and I did need to do that. But I also, as far as to build a business and a career in that, I needed, I needed more help with people than I did with horses, you know. And it took me, it took me a long time to realize that, but that yeah. was the reality. Yeah, man, that that's so important what you just said, and I think that applies to really anything, you know, and. and when you are coming up and we're trying to figure out what we want to do and, and we're listening to the advice we had that's in our environment, our surroundings, you know, the people saying do this, don't do this, go get, go to school and get a good job and that pays good and on and on, get married, have kids, all of these things that I think this has came up on every show this week. The social conditioning that we're around somewhat dictates the way we think. It dictates um, the decisions we make. and. Uh, growing up like i was taught to do those things right and so that is where my priorities were go to school and get a good job and like what i really wanted to do kind of took a back seat you know what i mean and so i'm curious to know from you like 
you said you heard that a lot growing up, like you can't make money as a horse trainer. And I don't know if you were influenced to try to do something else, um, but I'm curious to hear from you, like how did you overcome some of those words that were, were, were given to you? Oh, how did I, how did I overcome them? Uh, I didn't really until until recently, to be honest, but I just, you know, I was just finally like, I knew that I loved cutting more than any other occupation or anything mm -hmm. in the world, more than any other thing with horses. And I was just like, gonna have to do it and see where the where the chips fall. Yeah. And you know, you, you can tell yourself you're not very good quite a bit. It's very easy to doubt yourself because it is hard, like we said, but it, you know, uh, here, here's how I put it. I used to get bucked off a lot. And I got made fun of for getting bucked off. And I I wasn't scared. I, I'm pretty tough. I don't really mind hitting the ground. I've done that before. But, and you know, my brother could always ride a horse that was bucking. And so could, it seemed like the people around me could. I got bucked off a of Copus Pepto two times. And that, that horse could buck pretty good. That's one of my favorite, favorite horses for a lot, a lot of reasons. And uh, I got bucked off of him several, two times. When I decided to turn in my card, I was like, you know, if you're gonna be a real trainer now instead of just a non-pro, you got to be able to ride a horse that bucks. And so the next time one bucks, you are not coming off. And it had been a little while since I'd bucked, gotten bucked off anyway, but I thought, you know, next time. Well, luckily, and nobody knows this story until just now, but because I never told anybody because they wouldn't have believed it anyway. Copus tried me again, and that time I, no one was there and I got him. I rode him, and when I got done, I was like, huh, that was good. And then I was like, no, what was so different that time? And what was different was that time I thought about staying on instead of coming off. <laughs> and that was the only damn thing that was different. Yeah. So when I finally realized that it didn't really matter if I was a very good cutting horse trainer or not, I was just going to be one and I was going to keep working on it, then I started getting better. Yeah. And it still takes a while, even when you start saying that I can instead of that I can't, but right. it's, 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 a, it's a lot quicker once you start doing that. Yeah, for sure. That mindset shift, um, it, it reminds me of the quote, I think it was Henry Ford that said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. You know, and so buying into um, your own beliefs, um, over time, the compound effect will take over, you know, and uh, I was just reminded of that. I, I, I think I told you about my trip down to Terlingua. Yes. Sir. I was there for two weeks and it, it was a simulation and, um, but there were so many life lessons in that trip and, uh, and it was a great metaphor for what we do in everyday life. You know, I, I wanted, I'll give you a very short synopsis. I wanted to play my guitar for money. And so I was only there with $50 and I got down to $11 and I'm freaking out. I don't want to go home, sleeping outside. And um, I thought I had to get a job. I went to the river boat or the river rafting places and was trying to clean those and trying to wait tables and all of these things to earn money. Meanwhile, I wanted to really be on uh, busking, playing, playing guitar for money. And once I did, once I committed, once I overcame the fears and the worries, man, doors started to open, right? I started to meet people and things that I did, couldn't even imagine. And so I, I say it's a great metaphor for life because I do, I firmly believe if we do the thing that we want to do with a focused intent, good shit's gonna happen. Yes, sir. It's gonna happen. And, and what we have to do is reframe the negative default that every human has and, and do what you just said and reframe that mindset. Yes, sir. Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing that now. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, I'm, I want to again, like I said, I'm gonna I'm gonna bounce around a little bit here, um, but talk about that. You know, coming up as Boyd Rice's son, I mean, in the Rice family, I'm sure there are expectations put on you by others, and then from yourself. How do you overcome what what some may call the imposter syndrome, or maybe thinking you're not good enough for the self judgments? I don't, I'm not projecting that on you, but if that was a thing, I know a lot of people struggle with it, and, and would love to hear how you overcame some of that stuff. You know, Taryn always did really well from the beginning, and I did not. And I'm I'm older. He he actually showed one day before I did, and then I started after that. But so he's he's got quite a bit of experience that I don't have. 
because he started before. But, <laughs> um, you know, he would, Taryn just didn't worry about it. He would just go show or he'd just hop on a horse and go ride. And I was always, it appeared that I was not as good. And I thought that too. And I was always thinking and thinking and thinking. I knew that then. And I knew that things didn't really make sense to me. And they seemed to make sense to him. Uh, but looking back on it, if I'd have just quit thinking, I'd have, I'd have been fine. But I, at this point, I don't regret all the thinking because the thinking, now that I think I can do it, the fact that I can think quite a bit seems to get me out of quite a bit of jams. Uh, mm. And I don't want to say that to sound arrogant, but... Some of the stuff I used to worry about has paid off for me in the long run, I guess I'd put it that way. So what, were, what was it you were thinking about? What was it that you were worrying about? Was it, was it winning? Was it the no, outcome or no, result? No it, was, no, it was the... Talking about horse training, the... I had to understand something before I could do it. Mm. So, and like Taryn, Taryn did not... Taryn could be on a horse and working it and dad would say all right now step him up there and so he'll fill that cow mm -hmm. Taryn would do it and then it'd be my turn and he'd same thing and i'm like what's that mean and he's like he's like well didn't you just see him do it and i'm like yeah i saw that but i'm not sure what i'm supposed to do and he'd probably get a little frustrated than i would and Taryn's over there pretty happy with himself off <laughs> you know gonna run off somewhere while i go finish up the chores usually but <laughs> but yeah, that caused me problems, but uh, it's it doesn't anymore. And looking back, it was just I didn't know which questions to ask, or mm. or maybe I was I was making it too complicated. But explaining this stuff is very very difficult. Um, yeah, it's very difficult. Well, I but it's like. No matter what we do, you know, anytime we, whether we're starting something new or even in once we're into it, I've sat down with some musicians and it's like avoiding the comparison game. You know, they're always, they're always going to be somebody better. They may seem like they're more natural. And, and, and again, for me, um, I know exactly what you're talking about. Like I only got into cutting about a year ago. And so I'm riding with James Payne and he's like very Socratic in his teaching. He's going to ask me a lot of questions and he'll ride a horse and say, okay, what'd you see? And I'm like, you don't have a fucking clue. <laughs> I have no idea what you're doing, you know, because all of everything he's doing is feel and timing, and it's so. so... I've watched him quite a bit, and I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so even if you don't know, then I damn sure don't know. And um, so it's just a lack of awareness on my part and, and being new. Um, but so, okay, how did you stick with that, though? How did you. You know, Taryn seems like he's getting this thing very easy. Like, how do you not compl play that comparison game with him or anybody else? That I did. I did play it, but I just stuck with it because I, I guess he didn't really like anything else. Yeah. I just kept doing it. And I, and I really didn't. We played baseball. Dad, Dad coached us in baseball, and we had a lot of fun with that. But really, other than cutting, that was, that was about it. I see. Yeah. So I just, just kept doing it. Consistency seemed to have paid off for you. <laughs> I reckon. I hope it does anyways. We'll see. We'll jump into into some horse stuff, and I may bounce back to some mindset stuff, but I want to know, in Idaho, the Mercuria, Mercuria Finals, describe the feeling, like, during the run. Not, like, not marking a 233, but describe what a 233 feels like. What does it feel like? During um, the run, what does that feel like? Well, in that in that moment, you're just you're not really you're just you're just reading the cow and 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 feeling the horse and you're caught up in the adrenaline probably a little too much, but that's why that big score happens. Um I don't know what I was thinking. I have no idea, but I remember I cut the three colored cows that were there. And I remember, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna tell you the three things I remember. Well, it may, it may be more than three. 
I remember what RL said to me right after the run, which I'm not going to say in here. I remember how happy my wife was and the, the hug we had and the tears that we had. And I remember the cap my little girl was wearing and the how long we rode around on that horse together after the run. That's that's what I that's what I remember about it. Yeah. And it was one of them. I mean, it's. I don't know if I'd had a run before where everybody rushed in like that. I, maybe I had. I can't remember. But everybody helping and stuff just, you know, rushed down there. And every, you knew it was going to be a big score. It, it was – that horse was just that good. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. It's, I got to think it's one of those times where time disappears, right? Like you're just lost in that moment. You're not yes, – like you said, you're not even thinking. Like you just tap into this flow state. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I watched that run over and over and over, man. And every time I do, it makes makes the hair on my my arm stand up. Um, well, segue. I'll use that as a segue into some mindset stuff, some pregame rituals. What are you doing to tune in? Like, we'll take that run for instance. You're on a badass horse at the Mercuria Finals. What are you telling yourself? What is the self talk? before whether you're practicing the practice pin you know during that day it's game day right like what is the self-talk going through tatum rice's head before that run (laughs) back then i think i was probably trying to see just how fast i could go and anymore i'm trying to make sure that i'm going to go slow enough and i tend to mess that up about (laughs) 87 percent of the time but these days i'm trying to make sure that i go slow and smooth what made that change though what made that shift for you oh hauling against austin i reckon was was what i would specifically say but that's it was probably just everything a bunch of years accumulating and building up really yeah yeah let's talk hauling that's a that's a a question that I uh, I would like to hear your answer. So for folks that may not be familiar with cutting, or even if they're in cutting and they've never hauled, can you explain what that is and um, what you learned from that experience? So hauling hauling is is what we shoot for when you're trying to make the world finals. You know, in whichever class, the, we can haul in all the classes: open, non-pro, 50m, all, all the way, all the way from, all the way up and down. And, uh, you know, it's, for me, like the reason I wanted to do it, I, I'd always wanted to haul and I just hadn't had the right horse yet. Um, but my dad had, had won the world and, and my granddad and, and uh, yeah, I just always wanted to do it. And in 2016, RL won the world and Easy was six then, about to turn seven. And I kind of felt like I had wasted that mare because I thought she was really, really good, and so did Kylie, and and we had not done nearly, nearly well enough on. Her. I don't even think now she'd won like, I think she'd won like eighty thousand, and 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 that was all my fault that she hadn't, and I, and I pretty much knew that, but that that mare was just, she was tricky and she was tough, but but we just we decided we we're gonna haul. And uh, it also worked out that we were able to buy Gildan for, for Kylie from John McLaren so we could haul together. And uh, we just took off and started. And the, the very first run of the year, second cow, Easy E falls down and breaks my ankle. And so uh, we loaded up and left Abilene. And, and I had seven weeks off. And RL showed showed Z for me oh five or six times maybe more than that I don't know uh, mm-hmm. six to ten times I'd say and and did really well and uh, and I was like and I was like see this is a good horse I've been messing up this whole time and I knew it and uh, as soon as I got as soon as I got back going I uh, I think the, I think Vegas was the first show. Actually, I know it was because I we loaded up, went out there, and I drew first the first morning, just like I did in Abilene. And I'm like, oh boy, here we go this <laughs> again. Last time I rode to the herd, I I left with I, I left at a limp, and uh, <laughs> and uh, so we we started up and um, and took off, and you know the we we went hard and we had a lot of fun. Um, the end of the year did not pan out very well, and it got very stressful, but. Uh, Z ended up second, 
Kylie ended up second, and uh, at the time, it seemed like that really sucked. And mm. to put basically 365 days uh, into something, and and then it and then to end up second, that seemed bad. And then Phil Rapp told me, I remember very vividly at at Waco last show I believe the last show of that of that hauling year uh, he's like you're gonna look he knew that I knew that I was most likely gonna be second at that point and I did know everyone knew and uh, he he said you know he said Tater you're gonna look back on this one day and and it's gonna mean quite a bit to you and I I knew he was right, but I still wasn't very inspired right then. And I thought, you know, yeah, probably so in like 10 years. And it started paying off a lot sooner than that. Uh, Yeah, um, or I think it did. Yeah. But I I, kind of think, well, that took a while to get over, uh, to be real honest. But every single looking back on that one that that seemed like a big one i guess because it did take a while but every failure i've had since then and and there's about four or five each day get over them i get over them a lot quicker and i learned something good from them a lot quicker like that that took a while but once i finally really assessed it for what it was and made sure i got the good out of it rather Mm -hmm. than the bad now that took a while but i did it yeah um but the other things, the other losses, the other failures, when you look at them real closely, you can get to get out of them really quickly. Yeah. Depends on our perception, right? <laughs> Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, one thing you said was that hauling that year made you more confident. It was that just because of the at-bats? Was that, you know, getting so many reps in throughout the year? Um, maybe bad cattle or whatever the situation may be there's a lot of variables in cutting especially the weekend show so what was it about that that made you more confident well it's it's the amount the at bats like you said but then being you know like i when i started that journey i was very accustomed to my fort worth team being there most all the time when i showed me and my my herd holders and my turn back men and you're out hauling all the time your regular people aren't there and you yeah. have to kind of get used to whoever is there and you end up having to i was what i found out was i was leaning too much on my help and not enough on myself and i needed to i needed to take responsibility and it was that two and a half minutes was mine and i need to handle it how i want to handle it basically and when i had to do that i got more confident picking cows and stuff yeah you know yeah. Like when you really bear down and do it, it's like, don't assume you're wrong. Like when you, and I, I told somebody that the other day, it's, it's like if you think they're, if it's a fast cow, it's probably a fast cow. If you think it's a slow cow, it's probably a slow cow. And just assume you're right instead of you're wrong. And like if you let the cow prove you're wrong instead of you doing it, yeah. you know, it's like if, if, you, if you think you're cutting a good cow and it runs really, really fast, so what you messed up and then be like no i wonder how did i miss that you know don't be like i suck at watching cows (laughs) you know that's because everybody does it you know yeah that's everybody messes up and and the more you do it the less you do it but it never goes away right you you know the messing up part yeah that that goes back to something that's so simple right just focus on controlling what you can control which is our mind how we, re- how we react to situations and the stories that we tell ourselves. And it seems like you had a shift somewhere in your, in your career, like um, a more a positive shift, a reframe in your thinking. Uh, I'm curious to know what, when and what was it that, that shifted that mindset for you? You know, doing a lot of reading is, is one thing, but some of the things that Don was doing were some of the things that I wanted to improve on. And I kind of started watching that and 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 we started working together quite a bit and and uh when i kind of just realized that i i did learn a lot a lot of stuff from him but mostly he's just a lot more positive than i was Mm -hmm. and if somebody asks him a question his first thought is yes we can instead of no we can't and and just 
being a little more positive. That's that's kind of yeah. that. Like he's pretty good at that. Yeah, man, that's so. And I am too now, but I wasn't then. <laughs> yeah, but that's what's so important, you know. And we, you, it's nothing new. Like we become what we think about, and also like who we surround ourselves with is so important. I know it's been said many times. Like we are the sum of the five people we're around most. And when I first heard that, I thought about it, and I was like, holy shit, that's so true. You yes, know? So I'm very conscious about who I surround myself with, the input that comes into my brain. Um, so I'm curious for, to know the answer for you, and we'll talk specifically horse training. Like, who, who are your, who's in your inner circle? Like, who are you leaning on for advice, whether they're mentors or peers um, that you may be even competing against? Um, who are some of those people, and what's some of the advice that you've been given? Oh shoot! There's been so many. There, I mean, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of people. But those two guys I was just talking about, I talked to a lot, and and RL a lot, and my dad, my brother, Matt Miller. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of a lot of people. Yeah. Um, but I mean, over the years, so many people taught me so much. Tag and Ronnie taught me a whole whole lot. Um, but there's just so many. Yeah. I got you. Um, let's talk about routines, habits. What are you doing day to day when you're at the house, not at a show? When you're at the house, what does a typical day for, for Tatum Rice look like? Uh, so we usually start working horses about four, um, maybe five, maybe six, but it just kind of depends. But usually like during a Fort Worth show or something at 3.45, I'm, I'm working a horse. Um, this morning we we started at 4:40, or I I was there at 4:45 on the first one. Um, but this morning, uh, <laughs> I don't even want to tell you what time I got up this morning, but I got up at 1:30, uh, not because I was planning on it. I had my alarm set for three, but I woke up and got up. Um, oh, I sent some emails, sent some videos of some horses that I, some three-year-olds that I'd videoed. I worked on some spreadsheets to get uh, some things kind of organized for the BI and just a lot of that sort of stuff and drank my coffee and yeah uh, I, I yeah read I do quite a bit of reading and that's what I did and then and then uh, headed down the head down to the barn you know after that how many head how many head are you riding I don't know how many we worked this morning probably I'm guessing I'd, I'd have to look in my book, but 12 or 15 or more, but I didn't get, I didn't get a lot work that I needed to, and I got to go back and do some more when I, when I get done here, because I had to, I had to le rush over to Silverado and all that, so normally yeah. we try to get them all done in the morning and, or, you know, in the one session, but it didn't pan out that way today, and that's all right. I got to do three more when I get home. I got you, and I asked that question specifically because I want people to understand what it is that you guys do and the amount of hours that goes into what you guys do. Cause yes, yeah, sir. you're a horse trainer and you're a showman, but you're also a businessman. You're also in the hospitality business with the customers that you guys have. Yes, sir. So I, I mean, I can't think of another industry that works as hard as you guys. So everybody works hard, right? Yes, but my question to you is, in your opinion, what is it that separates the goods from the greats? Attitude, I reckon. Man, and the work but everybody works hard these days if you don't work hard you might as well just stay home then yeah. period there's no need even talking about that anymore uh but attitude yeah yeah right attitude just telling yourself you can and being positive being nice being kind being honest that yeah that it seems to be like this symbiotic relationship between like a blue collar work ethic and then like this mindset this like being able to control your energy yes. and then marrying those two together again with a focused intent to maximize efficiency, to maximize the growth. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. It's something that I recently thought about. It's like working hard with consistency combined with a positive mindset. Because sometimes I'll get to one track, I'll get, I'll just work my ass off and right. but I have this negative mindset and it, it, it they just, right. it's like a magnet, you know, polar opposite. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm, I was just curious um, to, to know, like, and, and it seems to be consistent. That That's the answer. It, it is mindset that separates them. I, yeah, I think so. I think so. 
for somebody like me, an, an amateur, just starting and cutting, what, what would you say is a good batting average? If making finals is equivalent to getting hits in baseball, what's a good batting average for someone in the cutting horse business? Industry, I should say. Oh, uh, in a lot of barns, I'd say 700, but since you're in James's, you'll be lucky to get 250. <laughs> No, I'm just joking. Uh, matter of fact, if I'm going to be honest, nobody trains a solid or amateur horse in James Payne. So you picked a good place to go. Um, and I really, really like him. Uh, you're not going to have a very good average at first. And if you do, you just got lucky. Mm. That's all there is to it. Like, or you got a really good horse that you probably didn't deserve yet, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So I don't, I don't know what the answer is, but the, the point is it could take a long time to have a very good average. And then even then when you're doing pretty good, your average still might not be very good, you know? Yeah. I don't know what mine is, but I'd hate to see it. It might make me want to quit. <laughs> <laughs> um, Either that or work harder, I don't know. <laughs> it's, yeah, I think you said it. I, I did. I bought a, good, a very good five-year-old from the Cowans and uh, did well. Yes, made sir. every finals I went to, and somebody told me, they're like, you know you're in the running for Rookie of the Year. And I was like, what the fuck is Rookie of the Year? <laughs> I had no idea. And as soon as I found out, it just went down because I started yeah. thinking about it, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, but then I jumped in. I was working at it a lot. You know, I was going with James and visiting with him a lot and riding three, four days all day with him. And if anybody knows him, like, that's all damn day, yeah. you know? And so, um, and then I get a four-year-old this year not doing too good. He's doing his thing. James has trained the shit out of her, but I'm not working at it. And, and then I'm wor wondering why I'm not making finals. And I have to really evaluate that and be honest with myself, you know? Yes, sir. Well, you're not fucking putting in the time. <laughs> right. You know, my mind's right, but I wasn't putting in the time. And so um, I, wanna, I wanna ask you about um, the NCHA because I'm new to this, this, this game and, and you've been around for a long time. So I wanna know your opinion. I've heard it said that the NCHA spends a lot of money keeping things the same way. So in your opinion, like what is, what is um, something that could change the sport of cutting? What, what is it that they need to do to grow? First of all, we're getting there. Um, so we're already, we're already on that, we're already on that track. Um, Jay is so good at marketing and, and, and that sort of thing. And he has some big ideas that are, that are fixing to happen that I'm really excited about. And they are gonna pay off well for everybody. You know, nothing happens fast in this deal. And if it does happen fast, you probably messed it up. Is, mm -hmm. is, is what, I've, what I've seen since I've been on the EC. We haven't done anything very well, very fast. But, you know, as a whole, I would like we would benefit from just being a little more accepting of change. And I don't know what change that is. It's just like any change. Just be okay with it. It's not the end of the world. Maybe it's a good idea. Maybe it's a bad idea. But right now, it's just an idea. We actually have to find out what type it is. Mm -hmm. You know? But rightfully so, we have fears of, of change. But the only thing that can't change is, is how you teach a horse to work a cow and it, think about a cow. Everything else is on the table, in my opinion. And we just what, what do you mean by that? Like, what is everything on the table? Everything. What I mean is we are not thinking big enough. Uh. That there is a way to grow. There is a way to grow and we need to think bigger. Um, because the options are out, the, the, there are possibilities out there, but we're just reluctant to change. And I, I'm not saying I know exactly what that change is, but, but I do have some ideas, but, and I'm gonna work on them. Uh, but the thing is, you, change has to happen very slowly to keep from scaring folks in this deal, because we have pretty much done the same thing for a long time. Yeah. So the, I guess when I say everything, what I mean is the teaching a horse how to work a cow is we can't change that. That's what you got to do, and you can you can teach if you need to or have to. You can teach a horse to work a cow in this room, and so can everybody else. And we'll finally get used to it if that's what we really need to do. Right. But 
you know, being open-minded and considering options uh, that anything is a possibility. Like, if you think there's something that we can't do, then that's, like, you know, we, we talk about a lot of ideas and it's almost always like folks start talking about the negative things first. And I, I do too, I do too, but any more, it's like you can take an idea and just put it on paper and start writing what's good about it over here and then you don't even have to think about that for a while and then start writing what's bad over here and that may be 20 things and only six over here but if you really like this idea you just start taking the top thing and then the next one taking this con and figuring out how to make it into a pro until here before long and you might be adding a lot of stuff as you go down here but you just keep at it until you've turned all those to this side and now you have a good idea mm -hmm. And, and I know that that's sort of, that's kind of abstract, but you, my point, the point is you, you can work through the problems. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can figure it out. It might take a long time. Right. What does that look like? So since, since it does seem like, hearing you, hearing you talk, it seems like things do take a while to change. What does implementation look like? What does application look like to make those changes? That's tricky too. <laughs> Once you, it's like, it takes a while to get people on board with the idea. So even if there's something that everybody likes, there's a good chance you don't have all the kinks worked through yet. Like, I don't know if we've ever completely worked through the kinks in a program, which is fine. You just fix it as you go. But, right. but it's like, then once you have a new program in place or a new concept, it's getting that information in the member's hands so that they they can wrap their heads around it and understand it and you know all of all of that sort of of course you have to you have to get the information out before way before all of that so everybody everyone is becoming comfortable right you know um, but just communication 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 that's that's it yeah you know it's one of those things um, it's a very esoteric sport I mean if somebody walks in off the street they don't know what's going on or they've never seen cutting they're gonna say what the hell is this but my camera guys were with me during the Futurity. We did some recording over at uh, Kerry Kelly's booth, and so they got to see some cutting. They watched the semifinals and uh, loved it. They didn't have a clue what was going on, but they loved yes. it. So it let me know. It opened my eyes. Like, spectator, it could be a spectator sport, right? Like, but how do you fill the seats? How do you make it? Because I think, and it's been consistent with folks that I've sat down with, they say the cattle change is what kills it kills it because it slows everything down how do you fill the seats well so I uh, you know I, I've thought a lot about that here, here lately too and the fact is we're always wanting this the staff to figure out how to fill the seats want the exec we want to hire an executive director who can figure out how to fill the Will Rogers for us well I think Jay's going to stay around a long time, and I hope Jay stays around a long time. And I think he can help us fill those seats. Jay Winborn, right? Yes, sir. But at the end of the day, executive directors come and go, and we are still here. So who is really supposed to fill those seats? So why are they not full? Because it is in my opinion now it the staff it's on their ass too but it is our responsibility to fill the seats so why are they not full because we're not entertaining that's the only way you fill the seats is if we are entertainers mm -hmm. we're not entertaining enough we are not entertaining we're entertaining a couple of days of the show a couple of hours of the show but by then we've kind of watered our product down because we've been there doing the same thing for however many days. And I still love it. I absolutely love every bit of it because right. that's just what I do. But I think we need to start thinking about being entertainers a little bit more. You as a trainer or like bringing in entertainment acts, like bringing in things to entertain the folks, people? The folks showing the lifers in this deal. And what I mean by that, I, I don't mean trainers. I do mean trainers, but I mean lifers. The people that are, have been around for a long time that are sticking around and aren't planning on going anywhere, that doesn't matter if you're in the open or the non-pro or the amateur. 
We need to be entertaining. We need to put on a good show. We don't need to. We don't need to be, you know, arguing with our friends or with our help or with our customers or with our trainer, you know, in the arena. We need to act professional. We need to be entertaining. You know, have good attitudes, have good runs, uh, and and not complain so much. You know, we talk. We're always wanting the new executive director of the staff for this and that to market us. And we, but we don't really have that much good to say often enough. So how do we market that? And really, the reality is everybody that's bitching still really loves it, and they always keep coming. Well, why is that? You know. So let's. We just need to talk about the good and think about the good. Yeah. Instead of bad. And the fact is, if you do that, there's a lot more good than bad. One hundred percent. It's easy. It's easy to think negatively. It's easy to talk bad or think bad it's it's a little more difficult to put your mind to work and come up with some positive ideas um i'm going to touch on this man so recently you were in the running for ncha vice president and honestly i was shocked that that you didn't get it um how did you come out of that what where, where's your mind at what's your mindset once you heard that news so a lot of people were shocked and I was, I was, I wouldn't say I was shocked. I was surprised, but that's less extreme, I think, than shock, or at least in my mind it is. Um, I, I did want to be president. I do want to help the association. But the fact is, as I, you know, reflected on that, what I would say, you know, you're not the first person that asked me that or said that to me, so I've had a number of time, opportunities to think about it. And it's a very simple answer, and it's one that I am uh, well passed over. But for someone who has been around as long as I have and knows as much about this as I do, I must have been a really big fucking asshole to not get elected <laughs> at some point or a lot of times, and that's all there is to it. <laughs> that's all there is to it. Yeah. But that would be the reflection that I've had uh, on that. But, you know, the real answer, I'm... Like I said, I do love the NCHA and I want to help and I'm going to help the NCHA. Still, I've got another year on the EC and I'm, I'm excited about that and looking forward to it. And I, I like working with those guys and, and the, I've learned, I've learned a lot since I've been on the EC. You know, it's been, I've, I've benefited in learning more than I've contributed. That makes me feel a little bit guilty, um, but it but it is what it is. And and the fact is, I figured this out as I was going. I was going to have a hard time helping in the way that I would like to help as president. Mm. And what I mean by that is I do have some big ideas and I do want to work on them. And I was I was probably going to be held back a little bit to do that as president. And the ideas are so big and they're so far away that the president doesn't really even need to be working on them, for one thing. They, they, they're, right now, right now we need to work on some real near future things, and we are, and keep all that rolling. And, and the fact is, what I realized during a campaign, like I, so I knew, a few things that I knew were that I was not gonna. I was not gonna be dishonest, and I was gonna be positive. I was not gonna say something that I did not think was true. And I knew that if I if I made promises I couldn't keep, I knew I would fail. So I wasn't gonna do that. Mm -hmm. And I and and I also figured out that I knew that for me, since I am at every single show that there is, like out there all the time in front of people like I always have been. Uh, it, it was gonna be it was gonna be very difficult because unfortunately our members kinda think the president is supposed to field complaints. I didn't realize I kinda knew that but I didn't realize just how much until I got in the middle of it. And to be honest, I don't really think that's what the president's supposed to do. But 
that's what the membership wants the president to do right now. And the fact is the president needs to be able to leave anytime they want to because it's a little bit hard to take sometimes. Mm. Or at least for a 35 year old that's there every day. And I figured that out in the middle of it, that while I want to help in all this, about part way through, I was like, holy shit, it's not going to be good for anybody, any one of us, if I do win. Now, if I win, I'm going to set my career aside, and I'm going to work my ass off and take care of everybody the best I can. But I realized it was going to be very, very, no, it wasn't going to be very difficult. It was going to be impossible. Mm. And I'm not a quitter, so I stuck around, but I kind of backed off on my campaign and, and but if I win, which I thought I was going to, then I'm going to give it hell. But at the end, honestly, when I got that email, I thought, holy shit, we're all going to be better off. And then in about 20 years when I'm supposed to be president, I reckon maybe I will be. Yeah. But for now, we all, uh, we all got pretty lucky, is what I would say. And the yeah. fact is, I feel like I can do more to help this way than what I was going to be able to do that way. Yeah. I love that attitude, man. And everything does. I hope I'm right. I could be wrong. <laughs> well, I think uh, this may be woo-woo, but I do believe everything happens just as it's supposed to. Yes, yeah, sir. And, and to have that attitude in the, in the present moment, typically it takes us six months, a year to look back and say, okay, that's why that had to happen. But for you to be able to realize in the moment, I mean, that's it's a, it's a great way to look at it. Um, this may be the toughest question you answered, Tatum. Um, or the toughest question I ask you. So if somebody walks into the Will Rogers, I have listeners of the show that, that may not know what cutting is. So they walk in and they see a cutting going on. How do you explain to them what that is? And I don't mean like go back to the history of what cutting is, but like at an event, what is cutting? Well, it is very difficult to explain that. And a lot of times we get stumped when people ask that question because it is a hard question. Yeah. You know what I learned in politics? When you don't know the answer, make up some sort of bullshit that's really nice. <laughs> so if somebody new just walks up to me and asks me a question like that, I'm just going to start bragging about all the really fun things that we do and how good the horses are and how much fun it is and yeah. all my friends and all our friends and everything like that. But and hopefully I can be thinking about that answer while that's going on. <laughs> but, 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 but the answer is that we have two and a half minutes and you know, we're being scored from 60 to 80, uh, 70 obviously being, being in the middle and we're trying to separate between two to three cows in that two and a half minutes, trying to make a, separate them very cleanly in the middle of the pen without a lot of distraction. and. Once you get it down to one, you put your hand on the horse's neck and keep it away from the others. When it turns away or gets stopped, you try it again. Yeah. There's four other people out there helping you, and that's uh, and it's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I asked that specifically, uh, man, that's a damn good answer, because I do. I get asked a lot, people, friends of mine that aren't into cutting. What is cutting? What is that? Are you going to a rodeo? I'm like, no, motherfucker. It's not a rodeo. Yeah. You know, and then, yeah. I, and then I typically pull up a YouTube video and I'm like, this is what it is. Yeah. You know? Um, but no. You I, know, and that's funny. I used to be such a bad talker. I would take off my spurs when I went in places so that someone didn't ask didn't me. Ask. Now, imagine the marketing I left behind when I did that. I had a lot of opportunities to explain to somebody what cutting is. And because uh, I was a little scaredy cat, I didn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Um, let's say a young trainer comes up to you um, and wants advice, wants to know which way to go, wants to know what to do if this thing, if, if this is the road he needs to go down. What advice do you give to young trainers? I think it's important to work for, work for one person for a long time. If you can find somewhere, like just, if you can go to work for whoever you think's the best, just do it and stay there as long as you can. Mm. And that way you get a good solid foundation and I, I really think that I don't know I mean maybe I'm a slow learner but I really think it it takes it takes five or six years really to get a good foundation and the thing is if you're you know if you're brand new but the thing is if you if you get in 
pretty committed to a program and doing a good job and stuff, those people want to help you. Mm -hmm. Their customers want to help you. They all like you and they're like, hey, this guy's working hard and doing good. We want to give him a chance. So it's a lot easier to get opportunity, you know? So you really need to immerse yourself in a program and just become part of it, Yeah. you know? Yeah. And see it, see that, it through. Yeah, that's sage advice. And that seems like that's what Paul Hansman was in here the other day. and. And he worked with Bill Riddle, I think it was about five years. Yeah. Right out of the gate. Yeah. And you know, and just tell yourself you can and not that you can't. And it's but it's not gonna be easy. Right. What um you have another quote that I'll read. Um you say you hope your next one is your best one, and that's what keeps you coming back and doing it year after year. So you wrote a pretty damn good one. You wrote hashtags. Is there another best one in your in your opinion? Do you think there's another one out there to match that, or you, or maybe even better than that? Huh. That's a hard question. So the so when I went and talked to Buster on Tuesday, when I went and met, met Buster with Porterfield, like I was telling you earlier, we we were kind of got along those lines, and he was talking about Little Peppy, and he just said you you know. You know, I developed him just like I developed all the others, but the reason he was great was he just came out that way and it was in here. And hashtags is the same way. But, you know, these days, Buster was saying that they're just so few and far between, and he's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. But we have been breeding these horses, or they have been, we have been breeding these horses for so many years now that there are more of them every year than there used to be. Now there's still very few and far between those type of horses, but there are a lot more of them than there used to be when, you know, back in with those horses. Right. Um, so without taking a single thing away from hashtags or without giving myself too much credit, yeah, I think I'm gonna write a better one. Yeah, we had we had a hashtags out of, out of Crazy Born the other day. Um, mm. I'm not saying it'll be better, but um, could be, you know, <laughs> I want to say it is and see if it ain't, we'll just see, we'll just see what happens, <laughs> you know, but that, that would be fun. Uh, you know, rode the dad and the mom and the grandma and, yeah. uh, but yeah, I reckon, I reckon the best horses are yet to come for everybody. You know, that's what I figured. Yeah. How do you, man, you ride a horse like that, you ride a horse like crazy and you have this expectation of what's possible. How do you restrain yourself or not expect that from something else that you have in the barn that may not have been born with those talents. Well, Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes it makes sense. You can't you can't put talent in them, you but you just you just teach them to work the, all of them to work the cow the best they can and and that's then the chips fall where they do. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I got you. Um if you could go back in time, Tatum and give your 20 year old self advice. It'll be a two part question as a trainer, as a horseman, and then also personally. If you could go back in time and give your 20 year old self advice with the knowledge you have now, what advice would that be? Um, answer with the horses first. Sure. You know, listen to understand instead of listen to be right or wrong. Mm. So, yeah. That's what I would say. And yeah, that's the main one. And honestly, that could answer both of them, but for the second one, personally, if I could tell my 20 year old self something, it would have been just call Kylie right now and get going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because she's made me a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. How is that? So, for people that may not be in this world, husband and wife combo? Nothing harder, but nothing better. Is what I would say, and it's not that hard anymore. It used to be, but we've uh, we've about we've about broke each other's spirit now. <laughs> so yeah. no, not really. But you just figure things out. You get over the bullshit, and you grow up, and you realize that your your kids the most important thing now. And right. losing cows don't really matter that much, and yeah. blowouts don't really matter that much, and. Yeah. Being nice does. Yeah. And that's when the growth happens, right? In the pain and in those uncomfortable yes, moments. Um, at least for me, that's what I've learned. Um, 
So I'll ask you, what, when was the, what was the last uncomfortable situation you found yourself in that in the end led to growth? Working through some things with some people. But that's, I don't really need to get more specific. I don't no, think you're knowing right. that. That's fine. Um, and yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah. Yeah. What about this one? Um, so we always see, we see the highlight reel. We see all of the earnings you have, lifetime earnings, the futurity championships, all of these things, but we never see the failure reel. You know what I mean? And yes. that is when we grow, that is when we really learn, you know, maybe not at the time, but if we look back, that's when, when the growth is happening. Do you have a favorite failure, something that happened, maybe a perceived failure at the time that had to happen for you to step your game up? I got a bunch. Um, those two reserve championships that we got in 17 was would be the biggest, but um, when TAG was five, um, did really badly, did just did a bad job showing in the Super Stakes final, five and six. That was a big letdown one because um, we had the horse, horse of the year on our mind. And what went bad about it, though? What was bad about it? The cows that I cut were too soft, and I just did a poor job of picking cattle uh. on, on that quality of a horse. Um, it, yeah, it was just, just messed up. And then uh, bigger than that one, but I got over it quicker, was the... Uh, the Derby that year, the first round, I, I didn't do very well on Tech. 16 and a half made the second round and then did a lot better in the second round, but, but didn't make the finals. But I did not have him prepared for that first round, and that was not, ha that was not his fault. And it wasn't that I didn't try to prepare him, I just didn't get it done well enough. Right. Um, and, you know, we'd been, it was just a different situation than I dealt with before. I was used to what I'm going to show in Fort Worth. We've prepared that weekend shows and home, and it was just preparation. Him, I'd been at weekend shows trying to get checks, and mm -hmm. the fact was that even though he was being really good, I, I, uh, I needed to uh, get him slowed back down a little bit mm -hmm. and more comfortable, was, was the long story short, and I didn't, I didn't do that. Yeah. And so that was that was a big one, but the fact that it was so much better the second round felt pretty good too, even though it didn't pan out, you know. Yeah. Um, so those were those were those were two as far as horse related. Um, yeah, yeah. Right on. Was he pretty easy to get along with? Yes, he was. He was just so good minded to train, um, and he he was a stud. They're all they're all studs, and he. On the road, he would get fresher and more bowed up. But as far as training him, he was, he was the most willing horse I've had. So much easier to train than Easy E in that family of horses. Yeah. Just, just, just very willing. Just the total package, it seems like, right? Yeah. 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 And, yeah. Yeah. I, I touched on this a little bit earlier. And um, seeing what you guys do, man, as horse trainers, you are much more than that. Um, for people that don't know, you guys are in the hospitality business. Um, you're running your own business, but you're also you're a coach, you know, to your customers, to your amateurs. And for you specifically, um, I got to think you're helping your wife. You know, she's a badass non-pro and and doing the deal. I'm I'm curious to know what that is like, coaching your wife at home or through a run. And uh, uh, yeah, I'd be curious to hear hear what that's like. Um, it was a challenge in the beginning, but we've, we've kind of worked through it now for the most part. Um, what I, what I figured, what I realized was that being positive was the most important thing and not always talking about what we did wrong, but talking about what we did right more than, than wrong. Now you still have to talk about the wrong, but talking about it in a way where you're explaining it instead of being critical or or negative right you know it's like telling somebody what they did wrong doesn't help as much as telling them what they did right and what they need to do next time but just being like you didn't drive up enough or you're short to the left or you you know don't kick with your right leg or don't do this don't do that that's not really the best way to explain but there to me it's like 
everyone's a little bit different, like how they learn or like to learn or whatever. So you kind of have to figure that out. Same as a horse, but right. but most people and horses, I think, do better from positive reinforcement than negative. Now, right. some people just like you to be real blunt and direct with them, but and feel better that way. But they function that way, and that's good. But if they don't, right. you, you shouldn't do it that way. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and hell, even the, the self-talk that we have, you know, it shouldn't have a negative connotation. It shouldn't be like, oh, I shouldn't do this or, mm -hmm. or that. It should be a positive reframe, a positive reinforcement, yeah. you know, because all of that stuff sinks into our subconscious. We may not even be aware of it, but it's back there, yes, you know. Um, so that's curious. I, 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 that's cool. I was just curious to, to see what you had learned well, the thing over about, the time. The thing about co coaching on your customers is, if they didn't really like what you told them, they just they just go home and then come back the next time. If your wife doesn't like about it, you get to find out about that when you go to the house. <laughs> and so you better figure out how to communicate. <laughs> how long did that take you to understand or figure out? Mm. Well, our ninth anniversary was April 28th, so just a, just recently. <laughs> <It's fresh. laughs> just recently, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know how to talk about it because it just happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, while we're on the topic of coaching, I'll segue into something you brought up earlier. You got to spend some time with Buster Welch recently. Um, can you talk about that experience a little bit and, and some of what y'all talked about? Yes, sir. Uh, well, first of all, I'd, I'd never met Buster and I, I wanted to. And I'd, I'd asked Porterfield to take me out there, and he did. And we had we had a good time. He was wanting to go see him anyway. Um, but yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. We asked a lot of questions, and he had a lot of answers. Did you uh, you know about the caddy? He told us about the caddy. No. Uh, he said there was a, a fellow was golfing. He had his caddy, of course, and they'd been they'd been playing a while, and the caddy was studying and watching him. And uh, he had, he had knocked this ball. They were on the ninth hole. They were only playing the the first nine. They were they were calling it good, but they were on the ninth hole, and the golfer knocked this ball way over yonder into the rough. So they hiked over there, and uh, the golfer is assessing the situation and checking it out and pointing and looking here and there, and he comes up with his plan. And he tells the caddy, he said, "Hand me that that iron there, and I'm going to do this. I'm going to hit it." over those trees around that bush and it's going to go over that sand and land right over there next to the green. And the caddy, the caddy was worried and the, the golfer looks at him again and he said, the iron, he said, and why are you looking so concerned? You don't think I can do that? He said, no, sir. And he said, well, what makes you think that? I can't do that. And he said, if you could do that, you wouldn't be right there. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm not. I don't know what that tied into exactly that we were talking about, but I thought it's funny anyways. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. when uh, he told us that. <laughs> That's funny, dude. So how long were you there for? How 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 much time did you get to spend with him? Um, we got. He told us to be there at ten o'clock, and um, we were going to be there at ten o'clock. And so we got there, and I at ten, and I think it was about two when we left, but. Right on. Yeah, Cody said, what time should we leave? And I said, plenty early. I didn't wait this long to show up late. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did he get into any good horse stories, any good show stories, anything like that? One after another, um, thinking of which one to, to tell would be the, you know, would be the best, or be the hardest part. Um, he bragged on, he bragged on Mo a lot, he, his wife. He was very, very proud of her and the way she rode and how calm she kept a horse and how much she did for him. Uh, yeah. Reminded me of things, uh, reminded me of my wife, uh, the things he was saying that she, uh, yeah, uh, he talked about that a lot. What I decided after being out there is uh, men can kind of be assholes sometimes. He, We got there and he was and don't get me wrong, I'm not calling Buster Welch an asshole by any means. <laughs> it's a funny story, but we, we walk in there and he, of course, Cody knew him and I introduced myself and we talked and the lady that 
the lady that was taking care of him, he asked her to get Cody and I a cup of coffee, and, and she did. And he just had, he'd had, his breakfast was there, and he was having a cup of coffee right then. And uh, he, he asked us to go sit in the living room. He had a fire going in there, and, and he was going to finish getting dressed. He was dressed, but he didn't have his clothes on that he wanted to have on for the day. And so um, I can't, or I wish I could remember the lady's name, but I can't, but she got us situated and she went back in there. He's in his scooter and she asked, or he, he was telling her what he wanted done. And he was in, he's having to talk pretty loud so that he could hear himself. And mm. she was having to talk pretty loud so that he could hear her. And he was pretty, she, the first thing she told us was that he's been up since five because he had guests coming today. And, uh, we hear him, me and Cody are just sitting there chatting a little bit and, you know, a lot of pictures on the walls, pictures on the, in the, the island there, or not the island, the coffee table. Yeah. Not pictures, buckles and photos, a lot of photos everywhere. And, uh, we're just checking that out and sitting there. And here in a minute, I, I hear, uh, the button, get the button. And she, she said, Buster, I'm, I'm working on it. It's a little finicky. I have guests in the other room. Get the button. <laughs> and I, me and Cody chuckled. And here in a second, he said, uh, I need you to check this battery. And she said, Buster, I, I changed those batteries twice this morning. He said, yeah, the batteries. Check the batteries. <laughs> and she, she said, Buster, I changed them this morning. And he said, well, somebody brought, bought the wrong battery. And he, he was giving her a pretty hard time while she's getting him ready. Brings him outside and he's out, not outside, out in the living room and he's a perfect gentleman. <laughs> and uh, very happy to see us and we're talking to him and talking and I, I was wanting to do an experiment about people and about horses and about myself and some things that I've been thinking about and I... Uh, for some reason, we can think of ways to relate things to horses that makes it easier for us to understand. And I wanted to do an experiment, and I was telling him that, I asked him if he, because he remembers everything a long, long time ago and everything recently pretty damn well, it seemed to me like. And not that I'm an expert, I don't know him that well, I only met him one time, but uh, I was telling, I, I brought up a story he was talking about he was talking about the new guys on those ranches. How did they kind of teach them how to handle the horses? And they told them that from the girth forward belongs to the ranch and from, from right there back belongs to you. So it, what that meant was you can, you can kick them in the belly if you want to, but don't be pulling on them. Mm. And he told us that story and gave me an opening for my experiment. And I, I said, you, have you watched, and you got to talk pretty slow, and I was sitting really closely to him, yeah. but he was really trying to understand, hear what I was saying and understand, and I was really trying to get it to where he could, so it was working, it was just taking a minute. Yeah. I said, a, a friend of mine, Spud Sheehan, and he said that he'd watched him some. So he told me, you know, Graham Amos is who Spud worked for, and Graham's the Buster Welch of Australia, they say, and uh, Spud told me that Graham told him that the bit in their mouth is not is not as important as these and these. They're these and this. And uh, Spud told me that a long time ago. I brought that up to Buster. He said, "Yeah, I I reckon he's right." He's he had told her. He had told he told the lady that he just needed a new device. And she said, "Buster, the device is fine." He said, "No." The device is not fine. I could hear just fine. And she tried telling him, no, Buster, it's not that. It's the device. So I, I mentioned that. And he said, yeah, that is absolutely right. And I looked over there at him and, and I said, so you're saying, you're saying up here is more important than the device. And he looked at me and he said, yes, I am. So the <laughs> point is, I'm the same way. Like if I think someone, I can relate to someone or I think they agree with me or I think they get what I get, I listen to them. Mm. And even if somebody that's doing something for me a lot, lot more important, like getting me dressed, 
I might not be as nice to them as I would the guy I don't even know just because I think he agrees with me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now that's that's yeah. a little funny. Yeah. I said the same thing she did. But <laughs> the point is, I'm the exact same way. And I'm not an asshole and neither is he, but a man's work, your mind can sure work in a weird way sometimes, can't it? <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> that device right there ain't as important as this one. <coughs> Man, that's so true. So true. But huh? he's, he's sharp as a tack, I, I promise. Yeah. Yeah, he's sharp. Man, I would, I would love to have been a fly on the wall <laughs> we asked during him that about conversation. Settling. We asked him about settling. We said, what do you think we could do better these days settling? We had to repeat the question a couple times. and He said, if I ever get slowed down enough, I will come help y'all with that. <laughs> he said, that, that would be good. What do you reckon we need to do? And he said, they're just taking the life out of them. Y'all, he said, are just taking the life out of them, settling them too long. Mm. He said, it, I know it's because they're wild and they're worried that that first guy's cows are going to flush out on that first guy. He said, and they might. I said, well, what do you do about that then? And he said, well, if that first guy can't cut very good, you better hire good herd holders. <laughs> I said, well, that's a good point, I reckon. <laughs> that may be how I get away with it. I got good herd holders. <laughs> so tell me this. So I, I'm new to cutting, so I don't know the Buster, really know the Buster Welch days. Like, were there less... Was it less time um, involved with, with settling cattle and stuff like that? I don't really know that exactly, but I would say I'd say probably yeah, and I'm not sure exactly why. But, but were yeah. the cattle more numb back then than what they are now? I doubt it. I mean, they were different. You, you watch videos; they were different type of cattle. Yeah, you know, a lot of those old videos, a lot of red ballies, a lot of black ballies, a lot of herefords, that sort of thing. And you know, you know what the herds look like these days. The cows are bred differently, um, uh, and and they used to not. I wasn't there, but I've just heard they used to not put as much emphasis on sitting up there and actually watching the cows quite as diligently as we do these days. Really? Yeah. They they. I, it, it's, and he talked about this some yesterday. A lot of times they would watch cows on their show horses and turn back on their show horses and then go in there and show. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. When do you think, when did that shift? When did that you know, start to get more fine tuned? And I don't remember who told me this, but I was told that the first person to really start using the cow list was Barbara Schulte. Don't know if that's accurate or not, and I don't remember who told me, but I, I was told that. And then I I guess everybody else just decided that was a lot easier way to remember. Right. Yeah. Right. That's interesting. I'm curious to know what's a... Uh, I just started sitting in the cow box and kind of getting a vibe for that, and it reminds me of being in a locker room. You know, yeah. everybody up there just kind of yeah. bullshitting, you know. The, does, a, does one story or one... one a one-liner come to mind that stands out that was just funny as shit. You, you know, there was a good story or a good one-liner oh, from all so of your many. years in the cow box. Oh, shoot. I, I don't know. I, I have no idea. I'm going to keep asking that. Yeah, keep asking But it. No, nobody's giving me an answer yet because I do. I get it. That's a hard question to answer because there are so many. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find gold one of these days, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, got, a, got a couple more questions for you, Tatum. Um, what did you learn through your experience running um, running for vice president of the NCHA? Um, you know, there's this negative connotation around being in politics. So I'm curious to know what are your what is it? Um, what was your opinion of that experience? Uh, the worst thing is you can't pick your nose in the public. I mean, you you can't even scratch your nose anymore. You literally become that worried about that someone who doesn't like you might snap a picture and put it on social media and make you look like a moron. Yeah. Like, you're literally that self-aware of what's going on. But for me, it made me end up being a lot nicer because I just was realizing how I'd been acting and I didn't really like it. Mm. And so I was like, huh, maybe I should have started this a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> So maybe I'll just keep going now. There you go. Um, what's some of, I think this is an important question. What's some of the worst advice you've 
you've heard or been given in 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 the cutting horse industry could could have been recently could have been like when you first started but what's some of the worst advice that you've heard I don't think I've ever had bad advice. I think I've misunderstood good advice and messed it up, but I don't think I've ever had bad advice, really. Mm. There was a lot that I thought was bad then, but yeah. if I thought it was real bad, I just didn't take it. Uh, but I've taken a lot of advice that was probably good and messed it up, yeah. Cause I, just because I misunderstood it. Right. Flip the question, can you tell me what the best advice is that you've been given? There's a difference in training a horse and developing their mind teaching them to think, letting them learn, that's different than telling them what to do all the time. Yeah, that's so important, so important. And, and uh, how long did it take you to realize that? Well, you, you realize it early, but as far as applying it in all the little ways that you can, I don't think you ever figure it out, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, no it does. Um, and that reminds me of a quote you said. It says, you pride yourself in allowing each horse to be an individual while, while enjoying their job. Yes, sir. And, and that kind of goes back with what you asked earlier about the different, I don't remember how you asked, the different levels of talent in the horse or uh -huh. ability or whatever. And it's each, if you, can, if you can teach them all to work the cow and read the cow and, you know, be logical about the cow, then that's about all you can do. And the talent level is up to them. Yeah. You know, like I, I've never had another one as strong as tag and I've never had another one as fast as crazy. And, and they just, I didn't make them like that. They just were, you know, that's, that's, that's just it. it they just were. Yeah. Man. Um, I could, I, I told this to a Don yesterday, I could sit here for another two hours and pick your brain. Um, but I want to respect your time and uh, I will roll into what we call, we now call this the slow fire round because there was nothing, you know, we used to call it the rapid fires, but there was nothing rapid about it. So slow fire round is brought to you by Ghostwood Distilling Company. And um, first question for you, my friend. What is one place that you've never been? So I know you travel a lot with, for different shows. You're, Seems like you're at damn near every one of them. Um, what's one place that you've never been but you'd love to visit? Hawaii. Hawaii? Yes, sir. Your beach guy. Uh, my wife's trying to turn me into one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, I do like, I want to, Kylie's wanting to go to Hawaii really badly and I've never been. I do want to go and I would really like to take Kennedy to the beach. So. Right on. And we haven't gotten to do that. We were going to do all of that last year and then COVID and you know the rest of the story. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, if you could go back in time, hypothetically speaking, and live for one week in any time period, when would that be? One week in any time period. Oh my gosh, that's a good one. Um, 2002. 2002, why is that? Um, that was when Tag won the Futurity on Chiquita Pistol, and I was, and that was, Dad was in that Futurity Finals on Murata's Rockalina for the first time, so that was a pretty big one for me. Yeah. Heck yeah. What's the best purchase you made in the last six months under $100 that has had a positive impact on your life? Best purchase under $100 in the last six months? I bought a book the other day that was called I don't know what it's called, but it's basically it's something you read every single morning. It's, it's something fathers to daughters, something of that, and you mm -hmm. just read a little line. I've been reading like five a day just because I like them, but it, it you read that first thing and that can set you up for a pretty good day. Yeah, that's important. Now I'm curious you brought that up, so I'll ask what uh, setting yourself up for the day. And you touched on a little bit of routine earlier, but are you? trying to read something every morning. Are you, I know you told me earlier, or a few weeks ago, you keep a journal for your horse training. Yes, sir. Are you writing in the morning? Are you reading every single morning to kind of set your mind right for the rest of the day? Um, yeah, yeah. It, it seems like if I do that first, and have my coffee and have some time to get woke up and go on and get my thoughts collected before I have to really be firing out there in front of 
everybody else that gets me going, gets me started better. Right. If I just hop out of bed and go to the barn, I'm, I'm not. I mean, I'm fine, but it's it's not my best. I'm not awoke. I'm not awake enough, and I might be a little grouchy and not just not thinking right yet. But right. I do a little of that, and next thing you know, I'm ready to roll. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, so I know you're a reader. What are some uh, a book or some books that you either reread most or that you've gifted to other people the most? Oh, uh, here lately, I'm. I'm done with it now, but I spent a lot of time reading a book called Think Like a Monk, which was pretty boring, but it was really good. Who wrote that? I, 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 I haven't I read it, but I've, I, I've heard it. Um, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but I'll text oh, it to Jay you later. Oh, it's Jay Shetty. It is, yes. Jay Shetty. Yep. Yeah, and I, so it's I, good. I thought it was boring at first, and the more I listened, the less boring it was. And then the second time, it wasn't boring anymore. Did you read it, or did you listen to it? I listened to it, and then the second time I did it as kind of a study and made a journal out of it. Like, oh, right on. I don't know what you call that, but analyzed it basically. Yeah, I do the same thing. Like I'll have tabs and highlights yeah, and sure. notes in the book and notes in yeah. a journal. And I was just writing and listening to it. Yeah, yeah. That, I think that's so important. I used to try to see how many books I could read in a week or two, or a month, and I wasn't soaking it in. Yeah, you know? sure. And so. Probably not the safest thing, but I'll have my damn journal out on my console of my truck when I'm driving <laughs> down the road and I'm writing shit down, you know. Yeah, sure. But um, I think both is important. Reading in a book and then also listening to Audible or whatever it is, I think it's so important. Um, I'm curious to hear your opinion on this. What is a three-year-old that you'd like to have? Ah, I may already know the answer. What's a three-year-old you'd like to have back again, either because they were just super talented or because maybe you would do things a little bit different. Easy. Really? Yes, sir. Because of which? They're so talented or because you think you do things different? Easy, but yeah, she, both. I would do things completely different. Yeah, I do things completely different. You know, I gotta ask, what would you? Oh, <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd let her train herself like she wanted to instead of me trying to do it. Because what she wanted to do on her own was a lot better than what I thought we needed to do. <laughs> Why is that? Because she was so cow or? So cow so smart, yeah. She knew when to go and she knew when to stop and I didn't. Yeah. Right on. Um, tell folks that don't know Tatum Rice, what's an unusual habit or um, something that folks may not know about you? Um, I like to cook. Um, and I played poker in an underground poker room in Fort Worth for about six years. No shit. Yes, sir. Hold'em. I'm sorry? Texas Hold'em? Hold'em and Omaha, but mostly Hold'em. Really? Yes, sir. Did you ever go to Vegas? What's the damn, what's the thing that used to be on ESPN? The World Series? Yeah, did you ever do that? I did not do that, but yeah, I've, I've played out there quite a bit, but no, I never did that. It's during the Derby, so that wasn't gonna work out. <laughs> <laughs> right on, man. All right, my friend, last question. If you could have a billboard, metaphorically speaking, to get a message out to millions of people, what do you put on that billboard? Just keep living. <laughs> you just read Green Lights. Yeah, about 47 <laughs> times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I did too, man. Um, and that's a great, that's, that's shit, that's a great advice to, to everybody out there, you know, just keep living. But uh, man, I told you earlier, I could, I could sit here and talk to you for two more hours, three more hours. Um, but I appreciate your time. I know time is our most valuable asset. Yes, sir. So thank you for sharing it with me and all of my listeners today. And um, I wish you luck the rest of the year, my friend. I appreciate it. I've had a good time. Thank you. You bet. I enjoyed bro. it. Yes, sir.